yeah, maybe I can tell you a little bit more about me and about the products I've been building. So those are some of the products I've been uh, working on. I have a little bit of a problem with uh, uh, not being able to focus on uh, working on one thing at the same time. Uh, I try to be better at it. Uh, so actually, beta list, that's probably the, the most uh, successful or the most popular thing I've built. Uh, I've been doing that for six years almost now. So I'm, try I'm, I'm learning to focus. I'm still like, doing all the stuff at the same time. But my, uh, my main focus is, uh, is beta list. Just out of curiosity, curiosity like, uh, does anyone know beta list? OK, oh, well, OK. OK, so I, I, will, I will describe beta list very briefly for the people that don't know it. It's betalist.com. It's a website where we feature up and coming internet startups, early stage startups. So every day we feature five startups that uh, have not been featured yet on the big stream, mainstream uh, tech sites. So if you want to discover like uh, what's happening, new apps that are coming out, uh, you can find them on betalist. Um, so that's the pitch towards like early adopters or entrepreneurs. Uh, but then to startups, it's actually a great place to uh, get your first users, get your first uh, beta testers. So the way it works is like you submit your startup to beta list, we review it, uh, and if we choose to feature it, then in a few weeks um, or a few days, if you pay, uh, we uh, that's a business model. We uh, we feature you on the homepage and in the newsletter, and like you get a lot of uh, like signups and like just like investors and like journalists uh, checking out beta list every day. So it's a great way to get some uh, early traction. And it's, it's focused on like startups that are still pre-launch. So you, you really only need like a, a landing page with an email sign-up form, um, and like a little bit of information about your product, and ideally some screenshots if you have them. Uh, so yeah, that, that's uh, that's beta list. Uh, so but we're going to talk about engineered uh, marketing today. Um, and so at first, uh, when uh, Peter asked me like, uh, hey, do you want to talk about engineered marketing? Uh, I was like, what the f is engineered marketing? <laughs> Um, turns out it's, uh, oh, like nice little animation there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so engineered marketing, so what is it? Well, it's actually a term which has many uh, different uh, synonyms, like side project marketing, maybe like satellite, satellite projects, portfolio strategy. So it's all the same thing. It's just uh, marketing. Oh, wait, that's not the thing I, I meant. But so. <laughs> When I understand that, when I understood it's, it's just uh, side project marketing, that's, that's how I know it, I was like from uh, W2F to FTW, which means for the win. And if you don't know what it means, like it's, it's not that uh, good a story. But yeah, so I was like, woo! So it's just marketing. <laughs> so what's marketing? Well, I'm not going to bore you with like what marketing is, but I'm going to give you a few examples to show you how engineered marketing fits in. So you have content marketing. The goal is to uh, get uh, people to your main product, and you do that by creating content. For example, you write a blog post, or you create a podcast. And the goal is to attract eyeballs, such a dirty word, strange word. But you attract eyeballs to your content, and then you send people to your main product, uh, which you monetize. That's where you make your real money. You don't make your money with the content marketing. That's just marketing. You make your money on the main product. Email marketing, you write emails to get people to your main product. Search engine marketing, you optimize your page to, uh, to appear in the search results to get people to your main products. Do you see a, pa see a pattern? Uh, yeah, you can just get people to your main product. That's marketing, right? And so engineered marketing is you engineer something, you make something, you build something, you build a product to get people to your main product. So the goal is not to monetize this, these site projects, site products. The goal is to uh, get people to your main products to monetize them there. So that's engineered marketing. Any questions? No, that's not the whole presentation. Um, so it's marketing through making, pretty much. It's not an excuse to build all your random ideas. Are there any people that have the same problem as me, that they build a lot of uh, different projects? Oh, not that many, so um, that's good. So when you hear engineered marketing or like side project marketing, uh, you might think like, OK, you can just build a lot of stuff and see what sticks. That's a strategy, but that's not what engineered marketing is. Engineered marketing is a strategic approach to attract customers and to send them to your main products and monetize them. So who is it for? Excellent question, Mark. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so it's for companies with a proven business model. Again, if you have a business, 
that's not making any money, like look at Peter Stark. Uh, if you're going to grow that, you have more problems. You grow your problems, you grow your losses. So that's not something you want to do. You want to have a proven business model before you really start marketing it, right? Uh, then you need to have the ability to ship. So if you're really bad at writing, you're not going to start a blog post or like a blog, uh, a blog about uh, your product, right? Like you're not going to do content marketing if you're bad at content. So you shouldn't do engineered marketing if you're bad at shipping products, at building products. So uh, hopefully you are all good at making products. Uh, Peter's presentation probably helps with that. Um, and otherwise, it doesn't make much sense, I think. Uh, and you need to be able to get free press. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that on how to do that. Peter already talked about that as well. Uh, but if you're having difficulties marketing uh, your side products, which are basically marketing uh, in themselves, so if you have, if you have problems like marketing your marketing, then you're doing something wrong, right? Like you're not going to like market your content marketing, so you're not going to market your engineered marketing either. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later. So why engineered marketing? Why, why care? Why not content marketing? Why not anything else? Um, well, it's, it's on this, this slide, actually. Um, so you want to leverage your team's strength. So again, if your team is good at building stuff, then you want to leverage that in your marketing as well, not just for your product, but in your marketing as well. So you want to build those side projects. Uh, it's easier to get free press, uh, I find, for like uh, side projects that are uh, often free. Like if I start uh, telling people about this product that they need to pay for, they might be a little bit like, uh, how do you say, like they, I don't know, they make this gesture. <laughs> um, but if it's free, they're like, hey, interesting. Like, uh, what does it do? How can I use it? So free stuff is much easier to market. Um, so that's, that's a good reason to, to, to do engineered marketing. And nowadays, like Peter talked about, like ads or that, like it becomes very difficult to market in other ways. So if you can provide value for free, if you can provide a product for free, uh, that's something people uh, want to have. That's something they're going to share with their friends and like with their colleagues and family. Uh, so that's why engineered marketing is becoming so uh, popular right now. Uh, and that also ha helps uh, to establish credibility. So especially if you're a starting company, if you're a starter but not a lot of, like, like not, not a lot of uh, reputation, not many people know you yet, if you start selling them something, it can be uh, difficult. Uh, if you start selling people something, it can be difficult if they don't know you yet. Like they have to hand over the credit cards. Um, so you want to establish credibility in some way. And so content marketing is a good way of doing that. You can show your expertise, but engineer marketing is another way of doing that because you give people some value for free. And then they might think like, oh, if I get this for free, I might get even more value if, you, if I pay for your other product. So that's why uh, engineered marketing is very really interesting. So what makes a good side product? Uh, I keep calling them side products or side projects, or I don't know what the term is. But there's like a few, uh, there's like a little checklist. Uh, so again, it needs to provide value, obviously, otherwise people are not going to use it. It needs to be uh, cheap to build. And when I say cheap to build, I mean either cheap in money, like uh, cheap in time. Um, because with products, it can be difficult figuring out if people really want it. Uh, you, you, you can think about like, oh, you can do research, but ultimately you just have to ship it and see if people use it. So if it's very risky, if it's very uh, uh, expensive to build, it takes a lot of time or a lot of money, uh, that's very risky. So ideally your side project is quite uh, fast, cheap to build, cheap to maintain as well. Otherwise, if like me, you have like a list of projects, if you all need to maintain them, like you start to move very slowly uh, because you are sp spread too thin as a team. So a side project needs to be uh, cheap to maintain. Ideally, you just build it once, you launch it, maybe you add new features, but ideally you don't need to like do upkeep. Like with a blog, for example, you need to keep writing to keep people interested. With a product, the nice thing about a product is that it keeps providing value uh, for people over time. And this is probably the most important one, attract qualified leads. Otherwise, what are you doing? Like you're building something, but if it doesn't attract qualified leads for your main product, then you're just building like a random project that doesn't generate any income for you. Uh, shouldn't be too competitive. If you uh, if you start building products where there's like a lot of um, 
money to be made. That sounds really good, but it means there's a lot of competition as well. So for those side projects, you probably want to focus on like a niche market, like a smaller market where there's not a lot of competition. Um, and you don't need to monetize it. That's, that's, that's a benefit of side projects, that you don't need to monetize them directly because you monetize them by sending people to your main product. Uh, leverage, unfair advantage. That just means that, uh, again, it shouldn't be too competitive. So if there's something you have in your team, uh, like a skill or like uh, in your network uh, that other people don't have, that might be a nice uh, competitive advantage that you can leverage. And again, because you don't want to spend too much time on the side projects, ideally uh, you have an unfair advantage, so you don't need to worry about uh, competitors. Uh, and it should be easy, easily marketed. Like, uh, you don't want to market your marketing. Uh, so the process, how do you actually build uh, like a side project? So it's actually quite similar to what uh, Peter does. Peter is a good friend of mine, and we have a very similar process. I think I have a few more uh, steps. Um, uh, so first, you start with like an existing product. Uh, they need an idea. You need to build it. Then you need to ship it. Uh, then you need to launch it. Then once you've launched it, you want to review it. Like, does it actually work? Does it make sense improving it, adding new features? Or should I kill it? Uh, and then you want to grow it, get more people using it. Uh, so I'm actually going to like go through them step by step uh, with a case study, because there's a lot of theory, and that's kind of boring. So. Let's talk about submit.co. That's one of my other uh, products. And um, does anyone know submit.co? I think it's fewer people. Yeah, that's what I, what I uh, imagined. So what it is, it's uh, just a list, basically, of beta list competitors or alternatives. Like, it's a list of publications to submit your startup to. So if you have a startup, you need PR coverage. Uh, you launch like a new product. You want to have a list of like all the different sites you can uh, you can email and say like, uh, "Hello, this is my project." Lol, I think was it right. Yeah, <laughs> um, and like with the story and everything, like look at Peter's presentation on how to do that. Uh, so this is just like a long list of all the places you can go to to submit your startup. And this is what it looks like uh, today. Um, I'm gonna walk you through like how it started. Uh, and how it actually sends qualified leads to beta list, because again, that's what we want to do. So first, you want to have an existing product. I, don't, I, I couldn't find a good uh, GIF or GIF <laughs> for this, so I just got David Brandt, because I think he's very funny. Um, but yeah, so next slide. So we have an existing product, beta list. Again, you already know what it is, so we can go to the next slide. Uh, you need a good idea. So if you're going to build a side project, you need a good idea. You need you need to know well, what are you going to build, right? And uh, Peter talked about solving your own problems and that kind of stuff, and I think that's, those are very good uh, uh, approaches. And I'm going to list a few more. So one, and this is probably like the, the most important slide of the, of the presentation, um, because it's something I only recently learned. Um, and that's map out your user journey. So if you look at the customers, the users of your current product, Try to map out how they use it. Like the first time they come across your product, or like the marketing page maybe, and then they start using it, and maybe at some point they out outgrow, your comp uh, outgrow your product, or they stop using it. So as a user experience designer, that's something you're probably already familiar with, like actually uh, writing out all the steps uh, that people go through. But then something you also want to do is look at what happens before they start using your product and look at what happens after they uh, use your product. So in the case of beta list, um, so what, what do people need to do before they can uh, get featured on beta list? Uh, so they need like, to build a landing page. They need to come up with an idea. Uh, they need to uh, write a pitch, like they need to get their, their communication in order. Um, they probably make a list of publications to submit to, right? <coughs> so how do you find out what people do before they start using your products? Uh, well, you talk to them. Like you talk to your customers, you find out, like, how did you find beta list? Um, uh, what were you doing before you first visited beta list? You can just talk to them. You can find out all the things they do before uh, they come to your main product. And then what you can do when you have that information, you can try and build products right here. So you can grab them early, those, those customers. And once you have them, you can direct them to your main, uh, main products. 
And something similar you can do with what happens after, your, after they use your products. It's not really engineered marketing, but I think it's very interesting. And so what happens after they use your product? So in the case of beta list, uh, people, uh, they get beta testers on beta list. So what do they do after? Like they start beta testing the product. They start emailing beta testers. At some point, they launch uh, the, the product uh, to the world. Then they start growing the company. They start maybe fundraising, hiring, etc. So those are all things that happen after beta list. And so if I build something uh, for that part of the phase, there's not really engineered marketing, but it, because it's not a way to attract people to beta list because the arrow points over there. But it's a way to monetize the people I have right here. So all the startups that come to beta list, uh, many of them will be hiring uh, for jobs in the future. So maybe I should build a job board right here. So I'm able to uh, use my main products as lead generation for my new projects. So you can kind of see this as like a sequence of building products before and after your uh, main products. And everything you do here is a way to acquire customers, and everything you do here is a way to monetize your customers. Uh, then other ways to come up with ideas is uh, look at existing traffic sources. So where do people uh, come from? When they find your site, you can just look at this in Google Analytics. You probably already know that. Uh, customer resources, like what resources do customers use to find out about in this case, uh, startups. But if you have, like, uh, what was it, the example Peter gave, like a motorcycle company, uh, you go to the mo motorcycle uh, website or you, you go to motorcycle conferences, uh, and maybe there's something you can do there. You can come up with ideas there uh, to, to acquire customers. Uh, and then customer support, I think, is often uh, overlooked. Uh, it can uh, feel like a burden. That's how I initially looked at it. Like, oh, I built a great product. Like, it's, it's perfect. And now these people have these questions. Like, they don't understand my uh, product. What's wrong with them, right? Turns out I didn't build the product correctly, uh, or my communication wasn't clear. So, um, but yeah, with customer support, you can actually find out what your customers are thinking, what problems they have. Uh, sometimes they have like feature requests, so you can get a lot of ideas uh, from uh, customer support as well. And so in the case of uh, submitted Co and beta list, uh, we noticed a lot of traffic coming from blog posts that were like uh, 50 places to submit your startup, or like five places to discover startups. Like all these lists of uh, publications, this is an example, but there are like literally like dozens, if not hundreds of those blog posts. And so they were sending traffic to us, um, but there was like no real definitive resource for these kinds of lists, like everyone had their own list. And these were just blog posts, and then we would get a spike in traffic, and then a few months later or a few weeks later, someone else includes this in another list, and that gives some traffic. Uh, but so that, that kind of got, got me thinking. And then we get like support inquiries of people that we don't feature on beta lists, for example, because we don't really like the design of the site, or like they're not a good fit for our audience. So they ask us, like, oh, do you know any other places I can uh, submit my startup or get coverage? Uh, so that's, that's a real uh, pain point they communicate, and a lot of people communicate that pain point. So that's uh, a source of ideas as well, which led me to uh, this slide. Make sure it's a good idea, so how do you do that? Uh, you want to make sure you have a proven need. So again, if you look at what people are actually telling you, if they, uh, if they communicate a pain point with you during customer support, you know there's a proven need there. Again, unfair advantage, we talked about it. Defendable, I think we talked about it as well. Low risk, actually we talked about most of these. Uh, so that's, that's the idea I came up with. Uh, definitive resource of places to submit your startup. Um, and it started out... Oh. <laughs> it started out uh, really simple, because you need to uh, uh, keep it simple, I think. It started out as a text file with just like a long list of all the... Uh, beta list competitors, startup directories uh, I found out about. Like this list actually goes to like a few floors down. Um, and it's just a very messy list, right? Like this is not a product yet. This is just a text file. And like you might actually see some duplicates and some, some random text in there. But I was just collecting this uh, while I was working. And like whenever I came across like a website that would be relevant, I would just put it in there. And uh, at some point, I turned it into a Google Doc because I wanted to be able to share it with the customers. Like I said, people started asking, like, where can I submit my startup? How can I get uh, free publicity? 
So I had this, this text file, and I figured, like, okay, maybe I should turn it into something I can actually share with people. And so I did the simplest thing I could come up with. I created the Google Doc. I just copy pasted the text in there. Look at how ugly it is. Like, like the formatting is all off, and like I have this weird warning. Like this document is a work in progress, but like I shipped it right. Like that, this was my very first version. This was my MVP. Like it can't be simpler than this. And then I went from a Google Doc to uh, I'm actually gonna I'm gonna talk about it a little bit later. <laughs> so I shipped it, um, and so when you ship a product, uh, who do you ship it to? Like who do you share it with? I would say just start off with the people close to you, coworkers, friends, customers, uh, existing customers. And the goal is just uh, to get some feedback. Um, the goal is not initially to like, launch it big and to get like, a lot of press. Initially, you just want to get some feedback. So in the case of the Google Doc, uh, it turned out that people had a hard time figuring out which uh, websites on there were relevant for them because it was such a long list and not all of them are relevant. So uh, that was feedback I got. Um, so I just kept shipping. Mm -hmm. And so at some point, I turned that Google Doc into a Google spreadsheet with uh, categories. And like, it shows like, how many Twitter followers the publication has. So you can filter a little bit on, on reach. Um, and one tool I use for this is Fancy Hands. Uh, Fancy Hands is a virtual assistant service. Uh, you basically ask them to do something, and they will do it for you, and it's uh, relatively cheap. And they can do anything that, uh, that any smart person with an internet, internet connection can do. So in my case, I had like a long list of URLs, and I needed uh, categories for that. So if there's like a blog about motorcycles, then I want to have a category like automotive or motorcycles or something like that, so it's more filterable. But that's not something I want to do. That's a waste of my time, right? Like, it's it's, my time is too expensive uh, to, to be entering uh, information in a spreadsheet, so that's why I use a service like Fancy Hands. Uh, and so we added like more URLs, categories, uh, reach, etc. Um, so this, I think, is version three of the product, right? Like it looks really crappy, but it works. Like I shared this with people, and they really liked it, and they started sharing it with their friends as well. Which Right, yeah, initially that's all I did. So um, I talk about my process, and so this is the step of shipping it. Uh, the next step is launching it, and that's where you actually share it with like, the whole world. And for me, those are two different uh, steps. And you don't want to wait too long with launching it to the world. Like, you don't want to like, trick yourself into like, keep improving it and never launching it. Um, but uh, I think if you, if you split up shipping it and launching it, you will probably be more likely to ship it earlier because you know, like, oh, not everyone is going to see it. And, like, if someone starts blogging about it and it gets a lot of press attention, like, that's fine as well, right? Uh, but I'm not looking to launch it right now. I'm not looking for PR coverage. I'm just sharing it with some people, get feedback, and iterate. Um, and this is what ultimately uh, became the product that we launched. Again, like, it's, it's basically still the spreadsheet. I think, actually, the first version of the website was just the spreadsheet. And I was inspired by Peter's Nomad list for this, like to stay, to keep it very simple. Uh, and then later, I actually uh, replaced the spreadsheet with like a Ruby on Rails application. If you're like a nerd like me, then you probably know what it is. But um, it's still like very basic, and it serves its job. Um, so yeah, this is actually if you go to submit.co today, that this is what you see. And so that's the next step: to go launch it. Um, so what does launching something mean? If you've already shipped it, again, it means uh, telling more people about it. And if it's free and valuable, it's not spammy. Like I said before, like if I try to market beta lists and like, hey, get your startup feature on beta list, pay to get featured quicker, like that's very spammy. But if I tell people about uh, submit.cow, like it's free, totally free. There's, there's no way to pay me there. It's just a free resource. Then uh, that's, uh, that's easy to market, right? Uh, and then one thing I actually forgot to mention right here is that uh, this one right here, you probably can't read it, but this is betalist.com. So I put my own website at the top of the list, uh, and that's the way we sent uh, qualified leads to betalist. So when you launch it, you want to send it to existing customers. Um, 
which initially might not make a lot of sense because you already have them as a customer, so why send them your marketing? Uh, but uh, if they've become inactive, it's a great way to remind them of, of your product. Uh, they might share it with their, their uh, friends and colleagues. Um, so your existing customers is probably the most important uh, group to market your, uh, your, your products to. Uh, then friends, family, because like, why not? It's free uh, to, to, to post something on Facebook, etc. You're probably not going to get a lot of qualified leads for it, but why not? Uh, and wherever potential customers hang out. And Peter already touched on this. Um, you don't necessarily want to get on TechCrunch or even beta list or product hunt or other sites. You want to figure out where is your uh, customer, what websites are they browsing, which news websites are they looking at. Um, and you can find out by talking to your customers and make sure that you, uh, you're there with your new product. And again, it's very easy to pitch a journalist if you say like it's free, um, it's relevant to your customers or to, you, to your audience. Um, so yeah, wherever potential customers hang out, that's where you want to be. So don't focus on sites you visit, focus on sites where your customers are. And it's in red, so it's very important. So I'm going to give a few examples of uh, press coverage we got with Submit.co. But again, Submit.co is focused on entrepreneurs. So the resources I'm going to show you are focused on entrepreneurs as well. If your product is not focused on entrepreneurs, these websites might not make a lot of sense to you. Some might, some, some don't. So first, beta list, that's my own website. Uh, if you want to get features on beta list, you can just submit your startup there. You want to make sure you have a clear value proposition. Uh, you want to make sure that you can actually show off your product. If it's just a landing page with just text, it doesn't perform very well uh, with our audience. So you want to make sure you can actually show something. Even if it's like a fake mock-up, you want to show that you have a real product you're building. Uh, then there's MailChimp. It's actually just like newsletters in general. We use MailChimp, but you can use anything. Um, so you want to build a newsletter over time. So with beta list, we have a large newsletter of early adopters and founders. So if we build something new like submit.co, it's very easy for us to like, uh, market it to like, a large audience. But it takes time to build that mailing list. Uh, but that's just something you just have to, need, have, to have patience and, uh, and build it. Uh, and one thing uh, I want to yeah, wanna suggest as well is if you're going like, to Mail people, don't do like the, the nice design email, just do like the plain text email. I, I saw it in uh, Peter's uh, presentation as well. Even if you're sending like a lot of people the same email, still make it sound personal, uh, make it look personal. Like a plain text email might not look fancy, but it feels more personal. Like if I open my email inbox and I see something like very designed with colors and a layout and everything, I immediately know it's a marketing email. I might just scan it, but then I delete it. If it's a plain text email, I will read it. I mean, I will scan it a little bit more probably because I think like, oh, maybe it's from a friend or like a colleague or um, like you don't want to fake it. You don't want to say it's personal, but you want that first impression to be positive. And with a plain text email, I think uh, in my experience with my audience, it works uh, better. Uh, so just try it out. Try out plain text emails to 50% of your customers and like a nice design email to the other 50% and see, uh, see the results for yourself. But that's what works for me. Uh, then Product Hunt, Peter already talked about this as well. Again, it's focused on like the tech community, producthunt.com. Uh, it's, it's a place where you can find out about new, new products, uh, similar to beta list. Uh, the way Product Hunt works is that someone needs to submit your product. You can't do it yourself unless you have like special privileges, but you really want to find like an influential user on Product Hunt that has a lot of followers. Have them uh, submit your uh, product. Uh, and ideally, have them submit it. I think it's just after midnight, Pacific Standard Time, because Product Hunt groups the, uh, the products per day. So if you submit your product at the end of the day uh, and it's ranked by votes, you might just get a few votes like in that last hour of the day. So you want to be submitted at the start of the day so you get more votes, so you get higher in the ranking. Um, and the way you can find influential product hunters, uh, that's tricky. That's just like networking, like you just want to make friends with the right people, do interesting stuff, uh, make cool products. I've seen some people like search on Twitter for, uh, I think you can search for submitted by, at, and then a username, and then product hunt, and then you can get a list of everyone that has uh, access to submit 
uh, products to, to Product Hunt, but you don't want to spam those. You might want to start a relation with, relationship with them, like uh, follow them, like read their blog, leave interesting comments, uh, give them helpful feedback, start building a relationship with them, and then they might uh, feature you on Product Hunt. Uh, then Twitter, it's pretty basic, just tweets. Uh, Medium. Um, so Medium is a blogging platform, uh, but it has built-in uh, distribution. So uh, a blog post on Medium tends to get more traffic than a regular blog posts, in my experience. Um, so you probably want to look at what people are writing about in your, in your niche, in your category, and see what's popular. In the startup scene, I see a lot of like, lessons learned, or how to, or how I did this and that, uh, kind of like uh, this presentation, but then in a medium format, or Peter's presentation. So if you want to get uh, exposure on medium, you might want to write uh, a story like that. And it needs to be like, related to your product, because you want to market it right. But you don't just want to market it. You don't just want to say, like, hey, go look at this. You just want to like, share a lesson you learned while building it, and then people might click through. So it's kind of like a sneaky way of uh, getting them to your, uh, to your product anyway. But um, yeah, so that's this medium works really well. Hacker News, for me, it's very hit or miss. I still haven't figured it out. It's like even more techy than all the other ones. So really, if you don't have a tech uh, product, if, if you don't have a product that's aimed at, at hackers, at, at, at developers, you might want to skip Hacker News altogether. Uh, only thing I know about Hacker News is that you don't want to link directly to your post. So you submit your... Uh, your product to, to Hacker News, and you want to submit it in, in Show Hacker News, like there's two categories. You want to submit it in the second one, Show Hacker News, uh, because then you're actually saying, like, look what I built. Um, and then you kind of want people to, to upvote it for you, but if you link to your post, Hacker News will see that you're asking people to, uh, to upvote your post, so they will like, actually uh, make sure your, uh, your post doesn't go to the front page. So you kind of want to tell people, like, I'm on Hacker News, search for it, I can't link, link it, and it's a hit or miss. It's something you can try. It's like uh, 30 seconds to, to, uh, to submit. Uh, and journalists. Uh, and Peter talked about this uh, as well. Like you want to uh, create a establish a relationship with journalists. And the way you do that just takes a lot of time. Uh, you comment on their blog posts. You engage with them on Twitter before you need them. Like if you go to them when you need them, like it's too late. You want to establish that credibility and that, that, that relationship uh, early on. Uh, to a point where they start reacting to you as well, where they become interested in what you're doing. And then when you reach out to them, again, with the short plain text email, uh, then they might pay attention. But if you just email them out of the blue, it's very difficult to, uh, to get a response. And of course, SubmitCo has like a long list of places you can uh, submit your startup. But again, focus on the websites and the resources uh, that are specific to your customers. And I think I'm going to say it again in this slide. Yeah, but so we already covered that. A and you can Google your competition, see where they are, where they are uh, getting their, uh, their customers from. So if, if a lot of, um, this is a bad example, but like if, if a lot of, no, actually there are like some, some uh, growth hacking forms that every time like, there's like uh, an article about 50 places to submit your startup, then it gets like voted up on those growth hacker forms. So I found out about that, so I of course submitted uh, submit.co, it's very meta. Submitted submit.co to, uh, to that form and it got a lot of votes as well. So like look at what your compet competitors are doing, like steal from them I guess. Um, and then you want to review it. So you've shipped your product, you've launched it, a few weeks later, funny, right? <laughs> uh, I was very happy with that one. A um, few weeks later, you want, or a few months later, you want to review, like, is this working? Like, look at your analytics. Is this product I created, is it actually sending qualified leads to my uh, main site, to my main product? And if it's not, you can keep it alive. Uh, if it takes some time or, like, money to, to maintain it, you might decide to kill it instead. And if it's actually working, you want to figure out like, which parts are working and how can I improve it. And you want to look at like, uh, feedback from customers, uh, any bug reports you might get, uh, and you want to improve those. So you become like this. 
the GIF isn't working, but that's okay. So you want to improve your product over time if you don't kill it. And like Peter said, you can relaunch your product multiple times. And that's actually, I think, an important takeaway as well, that launching your product can feel very scary. Like, you only can do it once, right? Like, you, you build your product, build your product, you build towards the launch, and then it kind of feels like it's over. It's, it's just beginning then, but that's what it feels like. But launching is just a moment in time you decide to tell the people about it. And you can actually launch multiple times. So if you launch and no one notices it, like you don't get any re uh, responses from journalists, it doesn't get ranked high in, the, uh, in all the leaderboards and everything, you can just try again like the next week, launch it again. Just act as if you've never launched it before. Like people didn't don't notice before, so like you can just launch it again. And the same is true with like if you add new features, you can make a big deal about it. Uh, I hope it works, and if it doesn't work, you've tried, right? Uh, so after you've improved it, uh, you might want to like look at uh, more opportunities to, to build more products uh, like the one you just did. Oh, there it goes. Okay. Uh, so finally, you want to grow it. So you, you've, you've improved it. If you've not killed it off, you want to grow it. Uh, ideally, you don't need to spend a lot of time on growing it. Because the idea is that you're growing your main product by building this. So if you, if you then also need to spend time on growing this, then like, it's a lot of work. Um, and I'm very lazy. But uh, yeah, the way you, you grow it, like Peter said, is like you, you add new features. Uh, ideally, you have something built in uh, where people can share your uh, product, like with uh, submit.co. Uh, it's something people share a lot, like we have a tweet button, of course. But it's when people find it, they're like, oh, yes, this is what I was looking for. So then they're going to share it. So if you're building a side project, you want to uh, yeah, you, you want to build something that's easily shareable and that's something people want to share. If, if it's difficult to, uh, to share or if it's difficult to get uh, pressed for it or like get attention for it for a longer time period, it might be the wrong idea. Wrong idea to, uh, to work on. So yeah, growing your side projects, I don't think you should spend a lot of time on it. Rather build just a new one and launch it and get press coverage. Oh. I keep forgetting to press on the button. I didn't practice the GIFs uh, at home. So to summarize this, I'm not going to read it because that's boring. Um, yeah. So hopefully you went from, oh, now I'm going to do it. What the fuck? What? Oh, this is being filmed, right? What the F to <laughs> FTW. Woo! OK, thanks. Bye. <laughs>
Peter said uh, you should do it alone, you build, build the sites alone. Have you built them uh, on your own as well? Or? So right now, Bayless is a team of two people, yeah. and I'm the only developer, designer, like, maker. So in that sense, I, I built it by myself. I, I, uh, when I started, it was just me like for a few years. Uh, I don't know if that's possible for everyone. Peter and I both happen to be like designers, developers, and we enjoy like marketing it as well. Uh, so we like do a little bit of everything. Right, yeah. Um, and I, th I think you can definitely learn everything, but only if you're interested in it. Like if you're not interested in learning programming, like just definitely try it out. But if you feel like, okay, this is just not something for me, for me I tried it. Then you might still need like a technical uh, technical co-founder, but if you can keep it simple, start just by yourself, uh, and it's also much easier to attract uh, co-founders or teammates once you've actually built something that works. Like if you have just an idea, like everyone has an idea, so it's very difficult to form a team. I find, but once you have built something uh, that works, that maybe some money coming in, then it's much easier to to expand your team. So yeah, I, I would advise start by yourself if, if possible. Uh, if it works for you, just try it out, and if it doesn't, then start involving more people. Oh, yeah. Um, you've been working on Bayless for like six years, I think? Almost, yeah. So I've been working on my stuff like one and a half years or two years. So how do you stay like, uh, not bored? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so before, that's a great question. Before I started Bayless, I was like hopping from project to project. Um, and that was very like fulfilling because it's, it's a lot of fun to do something new and I still have that uh, feeling whenever I start something new, it's a lot of fun. But what I found was that uh, at some point that became boring because I was repeating the same process. Like I was building something, launching it, not growing it, but like building something new, maybe launching it, maybe not launching it. So in the beginning, that's a lot of fun, but at some point, I realized like none of those projects were like uh, coming to the full uh, potential because like I wasn't spending a lot of time on it. Like I was just like trying something new, and at some point, I decided like okay, I'm just gonna focus on one thing for a longer period, and that was beta list, um, and that kind of worked out. And if you would have asked me back then, like will you work on this for like five, six years or longer, I would have said like no way, but I'm gonna try like for one year to focus on one thing. Uh, but yeah, your question was like, how, how do I uh, make sure it's still fun or like? Yeah, I mean, don't have a board for me. So for me, I try to, as an entrepreneur, I try to ask myself like, uh, like what's the next level for me personally? And so initially, just building something was fun. Then I want to grow it. I want to reach like a large audience. And so at some point I reached that, and that became kind of boring. But then I want to monetize it. And so recently, like maybe like a year ago, I started working with my colleague Rabia, um, which was my first step into like forming a team. So I keep changing my environment, I keep changing what it means to run beta list to keep it interesting. And so right now, uh, I'm probably gonna like hire a developer at some point to, to delegate that because the development becomes a little bit boring, a little bit uh, repetitive. So I will become more of like, a, I don't want to become a manager, but uh, I, maybe I will start being more strategic about the things I build. Like if I have to pay someone to build something, you become more strategic, more conscious about like how you spend those resources. Mm -hmm. So that's what I try to do. Like try to find like what the next step is to make the make the company and make the product interesting to you. But it's not perfect because you know, like I keep working on new products all the time as well. But then I kind of lose interest because I'm like, oh, I've done this before. I want to focus on beta list again. I don't know if it helps. We can talk more, more about it. <laughs>